This morning, I want to speak specifically to the righteous ones. I don't say that arrogantly. I don't say that uh, to be greater than those that may not have a relationship with Jesus this morning, whether you're in this house or you're watching online. I'm simply stating a fact that for you and I, as sons and daughters of God, you were created for such a time as this. It's not an accident, it's not a mistake, it's not an error, but you are part of this generation because God saw fit to mark you and you received Jesus as your savior and you came to the knowledge of the Father because Holy Spirit first convicted you. But there's some things that you and I are gonna have to deal with. And I believe wholeheartedly that right now the church is fixing to go through one of the most epic divisions that the body of Christ has ever seen because there are those who are Christian in theory and name only, and then there are those who are the sons and daughters of righteousness. And we're gonna see a division continue to come to the body of Christ because there's a multitude of people that want the word of God to say something that makes them feel comfortable in however they define God to be. It is not my responsibility to change the word of God to make you feel comfortable. Rather, it is for me to preach the word of God and you find comfort in truth. But that's the problem we have right now, not only in this nation, other nations as well. And I would love to tell you that life is gonna be cotton candy and roses and tulips and all this stuff, but it's not. I would love to say that truly the battle over Roe v. Wade is over, but it's not. It was a constitutional win for this nation, but the truth is we still have states that permit the murdering or the shedding of innocent blood, so we still have a battle to overcome. We still have to overcome wickedness. We still have to deal with sin. God does not wink and say, oh, they're only mere human. But I come to you this morning with a word to remind you that before the battle, there is victory. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's one of my favorite passages of scriptures. I've quoted it often, but I, I wanted to revisit this word out of 2 Chronicles chapter 20 because I got fired up last week. Now, if you're visiting with us, I just want to let you know I'm not the pastor. Our pastor sitting right here on front row, Pastor Sandra, but I'm an instructor at the Summit School of Revival. And again, we would love for you to join, whether on campus or online, you need to be a part of the Summit School of Revival. We'll mention that again towards the end, but I'm an instructor there, but I love that word last week. And I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube channel Summit Church TN, go to our YouTube channel, subscribe to it, but I also want you to go and watch the message from last Sunday called The Breaker. That message last Sunday got my wheels turning because he is the God of breakthrough. And a lot of times though, we have this mentality that he is the breaker, he's the God of breakthrough, but we have this mentality that there are things that we should never have to endure. There are things that we should never have to do. God just ought to show up and please us because we showed up and gave him 30 minutes of our time. I'm sorry, an hour of our time. You know, wink and nod and God satisfy me. But there are things that you and I are going to have to get dressed for battle. But even in being dressed for battle, and there's gonna be some things we're gonna drop of what we're required to do, the truth is, even before the battle, there is victory. In other words, the battle has already been defined. If you were playing a game and you knew before you ever stepped onto the court or the field that it was already predetermined that it was going to win, or you were going to win, you're either gonna play it one of two ways. You're either gonna do your best or you're gonna slack. And for a lot of the body of Christ, because the battle has already been determined victorious, we find slackers in the kingdom. Why should I pray? Why should I read God's word? Why should I worship? God said he was gonna do this, well, let him do that. But there's some requirements out of you and I, but again, there is victory. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse one. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Mennonites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Aram, and behold, they are in Hazaron Tamar, that is in Gadi, 
Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and he proclaimed a period of fasting throughout Judah. Oh, there's that F word. Verse four. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord in front of the new courtyard. And he said, Lord, God of our fathers, are you not in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land from your people, Israel, and give it to the descendants of your friend Abraham forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if a disaster come upon us, the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our distress, and you will not hear and say, you will hear and save us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you did not allow Israel to invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, for they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out of your, from your possession, which you have given to us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Then in the midst of the assembly of the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, the Levite, and the sons of Asaph. And he said, listen, all of you, Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says to you in this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up at the ascent of Zaz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeru. You need not fight in this battle. But take your position, stand and watch the salvation of the Lord in your behalf, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed tomorrow. Go out to the face to face them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of the Kaphites and the sons of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. They rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness at Tekoa. And then when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, put your trust in the Lord your God and you will endure. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praise him in holy attire. As they went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising the Lord, they set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir and who had come against Judah so they were struck down. For the sons of Ammon, Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, completely destroying them. And when they had finished with their inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they turned towards the multitude and behold, they were corpses lying on the ground and there was no survivor. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to their, take their spoils, they found much along them including goods, garments, valuable things which they took for themselves, more than they could carry, and they were taking the spoils for three days because there was so much. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how you read that passage of Scripture and not have something in your spirit leap. There's excitement in that Word of God. 
This morning, I want to highlight a few things, though. First of all, I want to tell you, ultimately, there's three types of battles. Number one, the mental battle. It is not always, but more than what you may want to recognize, your mental battle will be determined by you. It's often through Satan that he gets the credit for the effects, but in reality, a lot of times, our mental battles, we welcome ourselves. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that the, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, what do I mean by this? There are a lot of times the enemy will attack you mentally, but many times because we are not rooted and grounded in the word of God, we invite mental warfare upon ourselves. Many times we repeat things and we allow ourselves to walk in a spirit of fear. We allow ourselves to walk in a spirit of timidity. We allow ourselves to walk in anxiety. Now, it may originated with the enemy, but sometimes we give so much credit to the enemy that we fail to recognize that he that is in me is still greater than he that is in the world. Second type of battle is a physical battle. When physical battles comes against you, it happens for two very different reasons. Number one, believe it or not, we can bring the physical battle upon ourselves. For example, if you smoke cigarettes for 50 years, are you really shocked when the doctor says you have this? Maybe you didn't take care of your body correctly. Are you shocked when the doctor says this? Maybe you love driving 100 miles per hour down the road and you have an accident, you have physical issues because of that high speed driving. Did the devil make you do it? And we love as we're putting the Twinkie to our mouth saying the devil's making me do this. But the truth is it's more us than, than the devil. Unhealthy habits, sometimes excessiveness of what we do, recklessness of what we do. But then there is a physical side that is not at our hands and feet. There are sicknesses and diseases and infirmities that will come from the enemy. And I want you to hear me clearly this morning. God is not the author of sickness and disease. God's not gonna make you sick to teach you a lesson or to increase your faith. That's ridiculous. It's a religious idea and a concept and you need to rebuke that mentality. God is not casting some kind of sickness on you to make you a better Christian. What God will do to make you a better Christian is determine upon what you will do in the relationship that you have with the Lord. But there are sicknesses that happen to us. And it, it messes with us with a lot of times because we have to understand that God will permit certain things. And I don't always have the answer to that. Why do good people have sickness to attack their body? I don't know. Why does this person who never smoked cigarettes all of a sudden get diagnosed with lung cancer? I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. I don't have the answer. I don't have to have the answer for that. I just have to trust God. The third type of battle is spiritual. A spiritual battle, like the other two, can be opened up by you. If you love horror movies where they kill people and there's a lot of gore and blood and demons and all this stuff, I'm never shocked when you come to me and say you're having trouble sleeping at night. When I find out that you love gore, but your children are violent, I'm not shocked. When you welcome an enemy to dwell in your house and you call it entertainment, right. I'm not shocked. But there are spiritual battles that we didn't sign up for, but we're gonna have to get dressed for battle. We're gonna have to go and stand. We didn't welcome the demonic realm, but we're gonna encounter the demonic realm. And this morning, I want to talk specifically about the spiritual battle because the bride of Christ not only is in a, a season where she is having to purify herself because judgment begins in the house of God, but the bride of Christ is also 
having to recognize that we've got to get dressed for battle. Yes, the battle belongs to the Lord, but there are things that we are responsible to do in the midst of that encounter of that battle. And there are days ahead for this nation particularly, I'm not talking about other nations, but I'm talking about this nation particularly, we're gonna have a lot more battles, spiritually speaking, and you better know what the word of God says because I promise you there are demons that know the scripture better than you and they will run circles around you because you are lazy. Oh, I'm sorry. Because we don't want to read the word of God. And we're in a generation not to read the word of God is inexcusable. 50 years ago for us to say, I don't understand what the King James is saying. I, I, I get it because it's, it's hard words, especially for me. But today with the luxury that we've been afforded to be able to get the word of God, not only in our hands, but on our computers, on our phones, and on our watches, you are without an excuse to know what the word of God says. John 16, says, these things I have spoken to you that, you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. One translation says it this way, you'll have frustration, hardship, and distress. <laughs> That's an understatement. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The word gospel literally means good news. The good news is that God wants every one of you to come out of the adversity and walk victoriously. He wants you to live an overcoming, victorious life. There's a generation right now that are waging out there in anger and demonic spirits. And what will set the demonic off more than anything in this hour is a bride of Christ who has joy in the midst of the turmoil, who is smiling, who is happy, who is glad because they have found their strength in the Lord. And in the midst of everything that has fallen apart, you are saying V-I-C-T-O-R-I, -I, victory is my battle cry. When they scream, my body, my choice, you are to be able to come back, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Victory is our battle cry. But you gotta know what the word of God says. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter eight, verse 31 through 39, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is he who condemns. It is Christ who died and is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You're gonna threaten me with death? You're gonna threaten me with liberalism? You're gonna threaten me as if God will one day just to the side Oh, you don't know who I am as a son or a daughter of God. And I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know for some of you how bad or how hopeless that it may seem, but what I do know, God is still alive. 
and he's still sitting on his throne. Jesus said the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that they would have life and have it more abundantly. The apostle John said, beloved, I pray that in all respects you prosper, be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Today, Holy Spirit is saying that God's greatest desire for his creation is that we would live an overcoming victorious life, but it ought to be knowledgeable to us. And at times it should feel to the world abnormal because as a son or a daughter of God, you should have an appetite for the impossible. I'm sick of Christians that are trying to be normal in a world that is demonic. I'm looking for sons and daughters of God that is abnormal in the culture, abnormal in the world, but they are Holy Spirit baptized. They're tongue talkers, fire walkers. They lay hands on the sick and they be made well. They raise the dead. They cast out demons. I'm looking for sons and daughters of God who walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. In Exodus, Moses has an encounter with God. And Moses is at that burning bush and he tells God, he asks God an interesting question. He said, who should I tell the children of Israel you are? That's an interesting question because the thing is the children of Israel should have known who he was. Why did he have to tell the children of Israel who he was? Because the truth is, when you read the scripture, the only person that ever asked who the God was, was Pharaoh. Who is this God? Because Pharaoh didn't know, but the children of Israel should have known who he was. And I fear that in this nation, one of the greatest problems that we have in the body of Christ is we do not know who El Shaddai is anymore. We love the God of our opinion and our own truth, but we have failed to understand who he is. Moses, at that time of his life, he could have easily said, are you Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah Yudah, the Lord their provider? He could have said Jehovah Rapha, the Lord their healer. He could have said Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is always present. He could have said Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is their peace. But Moses was not told, and he did not offer up those names. Moses was told, tell them I am that I am. In other words, I strongly believe that not only was God saying I am, he's also saying I am whatever you need. If you need salvation this morning, Romans 10, 13 said, Forever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is the God of salvation. Do you need healing this morning? Isaiah 53, verse five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. How about power? Is he the God of power? Luke 10 and 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What about strength? Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. How about hope? Colossians 1, 27, to them God willed to make known that what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How about courage? Isaiah 41, verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God and I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Now, let me just kind of just put a little insert right here because I know we're also in a generation where people are deconstructing 
and they're saying, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. No, you need to get in the word of God more because three fourths of the New Testament is the repeating of the Old Testament. And if you haven't got enough an ability to understand that the New Testament is verifying the Old Testament, you need to get back in the word of God again and quit listening to that man or woman that looks good and you wanna be just like them. You need to find your way back to your knees, back to your prayer room, back to his throne room and get back to thus saith the Lord God Almighty. God wants you to be continually growing. He wants you and I to be increasing in every, every area of our life. And contrary to popular opinion, God wants to bless you. He wants to use you more, but you and I have to do our part. We can't get lazy and we can't let our guard down. You have to stand strong against the forces of darkness. You have to resist them in the name of Jesus. God, in this hour, I strongly believe, is looking for a people who are spiritually tough. If you're weak, timid, constantly getting your feelings hurt, taking offense to every little detail in life, discouraged every time trouble comes your way, and even when things don't go your way, victory will be a unicorn for you. You will never experience the best that God has for you because you're willing to settle before the battle. But for those who are willing to step up in the midst of pain, in the midst of hurt, in the midst of offense, in the midst of error, those who are willing to step up and step beyond the boundaries, God is going to increase his anointing, his power, his grace, his love, and his mercy upon your life. We are to love God and we are to love his people. And it is an honor for us to do so. And I don't know what has happened in the body of Christ, but one of the things that recently has even more come to my attention is we're good at loving sinners, but we're horrible at loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is not simply a shame, that is a sin. That's a sin. We should not execute our brothers and sisters in Christ and embrace the world and call it love. As sons and daughters of God, we can no longer make up excuses for powerlessness because powerlessness is inexcusable. 1 Corinthians 4 and 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. I, I've quoted a lot of times. I love quoting it. I'm going to quote it again. Leonard Ravenhill, one of the things that he said is the world is not looking for another explanation of Christianity. It's looking for the demonstration. I'm telling you, the world has bought in, has, has, has read your meter on cheap talk. What the world needs to see right now is the demonstration of overthrowing some demons needs to see the demonstration of signs, wonders, and miracles, needs to see the demonstration of healing. I want to hear more healing stories than ever I have at every point in my life. I, want to, I just want to hear those healing stories. I, I want, I'm looking for the, for the ones right now. I'm, this is sincerely sincere. I, I'm looking for the healing story right now where the woman went to another state to have an abortion, but everything that could go wrong went wrong, and that child was born, and that child was raised up to be a son or a daughter of God, and a revival came out of that child because that child, the enemy tried to take it out, but God moved in a miraculous way way. I'm going to see those things come to pass. I want to see legs grow out, back straightened up, cancer disappear, diabetes be healed. I want to see blind eyes open. I want to see prodigals come back to the house of God. I want them being able to stop playing in the bars and the honky tonks and the moonshine distilleries. I want to see them worshiping God more than they've ever done before. I want to see marriages restored again. I want to see homes that have been broken by divorce come back together because God's hand was upon it. I want to see schools not have to depend on coaches praying, but the students rise up and stand beside the coach and pray. I want to see revival hit Sevier County High School, Sevier County Middle School. I want to see revival hit the elementary school, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg. I want to see people come into this land and thought they were going to be entertained by one of the shows, but they turned up Sugar Hollow because there was a fire that was pouring down. I want 
want to see a victorious people. I want to see a righteousness of sons and daughters rise up. I don't want to be with the moaners, the groaners, and the complainers. I want to be with those who are shaking what can be shaken. I want to see God establish his dominion upon this earth. I'm sorry, but Kent Christmas fired me up again this morning. I was walking around yesterday. We went with the youth whitewater rafting yesterday and then had this bright idea, let's go to Dollywood while we're at it. And I was tired and worn out, but I'm walking through Dollywood with a near piece in my ear going, shut it, did keep that little bull, shut it, did Thinking, my God, my God, what a word. So blame it on pastor. <laughs> let's go back. I'm hurrying, I promise. King Jehoshaphat and the people, they're facing what seems like an impossible situation. They're surrounded by three armies that were quickly closing in on them. And King Jehoshaphat is told the news and immediately realizes, hey, we better run for cover. But he realizes that even though the armies are too big, and even though they're potentially gonna be overwhelmed and how they lined up against Judah, one of the first things, I don't think if you just read it, you don't catch it. One of the first thing is Je uh, Jehoshaphat is alerted to who the enemy is. Now this is important because later when we read this in the scripture, he quotes back to God and he said, these are the people that you wouldn't let us destroy. And you also said that they would not destroy us. Now back up your word. In other words, in another words, Jehoshaphat, because he had a revelation of who the enemy was, he knew how to wage war against the enemy. For us as sons and daughters of God, you're gonna have to pick up a lifestyle of praying through again. Stop guessing who we're fighting and start recognizing so that we may be more strate strategic and effective in overcoming that. Why would I pray for your back if your leg is hurting? Why would I pray for your eyes if your ear is closed? But a lot of times we just throw stuff against the wall and hope it'll stick and what doesn't stick, we know, okay, that wasn't it. Believe it or not, Jezebel, not the reincarnation of Jezebel, but a Jezebel type spirit is a real thing. But everything is not a Jezebel. There are types that you may encounter a Deborah type spirit. You may encounter an Ahab spirit. One of the reasons that Jezebel continues to have dominion in a lot of houses as God is because they fail to recognize Ahab in the house and all Ahab does is find another Jezebel to hook up with. In life, one time or another, we're gonna face situations that are very similar to Jehoshaphat. Maybe we're given devastating news. Maybe it seems like there's no possible way out. Maybe it's a doctor's report about yourself or a loved one. Maybe a marriage is in trouble. Maybe you're having a difficult time at work. When trouble hits, it has the tendency to knock the wind out of us. Psalms 55, 18 says, he has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me for there were many against me. The truth is God will give you strength and power that you need to make it through the dark times of your life. He'll give you strength to come out victoriously and he'll give you the understanding that the worst thing you could do is to give up. The best thing you can do is don't give up. Psalm 30 verse five, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Yes, there'll be times that God will allow you and I to be tested through trials that may come from the enemy. No one wants to be tested. We'll all sign up for Summit School Revival, but we're not gonna be signed up to be tested. But I hate to break it to you, God's going to test you. And you know why he's gonna test you? It's because he loves you. That's right. That love he has for you is to make you better than what you are in this current moment. So the test is not punishment. The test is because he sees what is in you that you have yet to recognize. That's right. You have to give him the authority. You have to give God the authority in that. And a lot of times what we end up doing is not giving God the authority. What we end up doing is giving Satan the authority. That's right. 
Satan ultimately only has dominion when and where man has come in agreement with him. And Jehoshaphat's facing this massive problem. But first thing that Jehoshaphat does is he decrees a fast. So here's the first thing I wanna tell you, and I'm hurrying, I promise. If fasting is not a part of your lifestyle, it could be one of the reasons why. You taste defeat more than you do victory. Fasting is not a once a year thing. It's not an optional decision. It's not something we just do for the sake of doing, and it's definitely not a diet plan. Fasting is a spiritual right that you and I have to deny our flesh so that we grow closer to the Lord, and some things come by fasting. He instructs all the people of Judah and Jerusalem to go without food, and then he invites them all to come together to pray. When you come to a place in your life where it just seems hopeless in the natural, you just can't see any way out of it, do you know what to do? Well, most of us would say pray, because the problem is a lot of times the only time we pray is when we have a need or we're in trouble. That's why I find this so fascinating that the first thing he decrees is a fast. And the second thing is prayer. Most of the time, we're not even considering fasting. See how quiet it gets when we talk about fasting? Nobody likes that F word. <laughs> Nobody likes it. Fasting is painful at times. But when your body is weak, your spirit is strengthened. But here's the truth. You and I also have got to turn our eyes towards the great I am. We've got to turn our focus to the omnipotent, all-powerful creator of the universe. We've got to keep our eyes focused on Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. We've got, to keep, we've got to keep our eyes and know that he is El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. We've got to know these things. We've got to spend less time in front of the clicker and more time in the word. You gotta learn how to throw your hands up to heaven like Jehoshaphat did and remember to remind God of who he is. This is not an insult to God. God didn't get offended or angry because Jehoshaphat is calling him out. Actually, God desires that us as sons and daughters of God would remind him, not that he forgot or failed to remember, but the reminding God of who he is is that God knows you and I know who he is. We're to remind God and thank him for what he's done for you in the past. When's the last time that you had a good time of just breaking down and thanking him for everything that he brought you through? And we're to remind God of his promises in his word, which you and I are standing on. Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. But here's the problem. I'm not going to do it, but if we were to poll a lot of people and said, make a list of the promises of God according to the word of God, we'd have a hard time coming up with what the promises of God are. We know by his stripes we are healed. We know that one. We might know that God would, that all men should come to Christ through Jesus Christ as Lord. God loves all people. We know that promise. But what about the other promises of God? And I'm just going to be honest with you. If you can quote anything... More than this, we're out of balance according to the word of God. There'll be those who tell me that I don't understand what they've done in life. And the truth is, maybe I don't know. But if you realize in this moment that you do have sin in your life, in this moment, you can repent. The fact that you recognize that you've done wrong is a great place to be in. Repentance means more than just weeping over sin and turning away from sins to follow God. It is a renewed mind that is the result of a surrendered heart. I don't think the same way that I did before I knew Christ. Right. Lastly, Jehoshaphat places the singers and the musicians out in front of the army. <laughs> and every single step that the enemy 
is hearing them march towards them. There is a sound of praise coming out of Jehoshaphat and the camp that says the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Now I want you to hear me clearly. The word that came from the prophet said you will not have to fight this battle, but you will have to go stand. And a lot of times right now in this nation especially, the body of Christ has been sitting way too long. We need to learn how to take our stand again. And I'm not, stand, I'm not saying stand for conservatism. I'm talking about stand for biblical truth. And I want you to hear me. If people are offended with biblical truth, they were never looking for truth to begin with. So how does this happen? It happens when our faith is in the Lord, not faith in our ability as a leader, not faith in an army, but faith in the Lord God Almighty. The word of God even says that with the mind, man will believe. But it's not about your intellectual thought. It's about faith that is superior to our intellect. There's been many battles I've had to get dressed for that I have no answer for. And I, I, don't, I don't even know. I was like, I, 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 don't, I don't even know how to process this. But I trust him. When we submit things to, the, to God and not the mind of man, we find and discover true victory. But when we depend on our own mind, we get unbelief and religion as a result of it. Living a life of faith will always fulfill expectations. But unbelief is so safe to us because it takes no risk. And unbelief, believe it or not, gets what it always expects, nothing. By nature, faith is aggressive. Faith has focus and purpose. And you need to grab a hold of the reality of the kingdom of heaven and violently bring it into a collision within the earth. Worship team, if you'd make your way back, please. There are many battles that are still ahead. And one thing if you would got from the prophetic word this morning is this. There's going to be a lot of things that's going to be destructive. And it's very easy to hear a word like that and go, ah, that didn't make me feel good. So I'm just going to renounce it because it didn't make me feel good. Why would God allow natural disasters when there are righteous people in there? Well, it rains on the just and the unjust. But if you're not careful, again, you look at the negative side and you don't discover the hope because also in that prophetic word from earlier this morning is the righteous will come away unharmed. The righteous. Where do you truly stand with God this morning? The world is an evil place and there's a lot of heavy battles that are before us, but where do you really stand with God? You know, I get tickled. You, you hear people talk about end time eschatology and you can see where people are at in their relationship with God because if you ever have that person mention that word rapture, you'll immediately see a lot of fear come with people and they go, oh, I'm, just, I'm not ready, I don't know. Well, every day that you wake up, you got a chance of death coming at you. But you're going to fear the rapture if it was to happen. You're going to fear being called away if it was to happen. You're going to fear leaving this world. The reason that you would fear leaving this world is because you're not actually in relationship with God. It's the only reason that you would fear. Now, I'm not saying we get a bus and we go right now. There's a lot of things I want to see. One day, I want grandkids. Hint, hint. I want to experience that. But if I fall over tomorrow morning, I won't make it to heaven and say, oh God, please send me back because I want to experience grandkids. I'll be too busy laying at his feet.
There's gonna be a lot of battles that you and I are gonna face in this hour, but I want you to know every battle that we face because of the righteous sons and daughters of God, you will fight from a place of victory. It has already been defined. If you will fast, if you will pray, if you will worship, if you exalt him, if you will heed the word of the prophets, I'm telling you the truth, you will know victory. It doesn't mean that affliction won't come to your body. It doesn't mean bad times won't come to your body. It doesn't mean that you won't have difficult days and trying seasons of your life. What it will mean is in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of the pain and the suffering, you will know victory. And you will walk around victorious and people will say, what is wrong with them? Oh, you just haven't figured out what's right with me. So I challenge you this day to rise up in the name of Jesus Christ. Take back everything that the enemy has ever stolen from you. Take back your family in the name of Jesus. Take back your finances in the name of Jesus. Take back your marriage in the name of Jesus. Take back our city in the name of Jesus. Take back our schools in the name of Jesus. Take back our sons and daughters in the name of Jesus. Take back every person that's trying to manipulate the children of this world in the name of Jesus. Take back our health in the name of Jesus. Take back what the enemy stole because no weapon formed against his own shall be able to prosper. We need to stand strong. We need to be determined. We need to walk victoriously. God has given us the victory before the battle. Deuteronomy 20, verse four. Prayer team, make your way up, altar team. Deuteronomy 20, verse four. For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies and he will give you victory. If you hear anything that I say this morning, please hear me when I say this. You will have to get dressed for battle. There'll be times that you will have to weep. You will have to cry out. You will have to fast. You will have to pray, but it won't be a place of a beggar in the kingdom. It'll be a place as a son or a daughter of God who knows who they are in the authority. I'm not afraid of a Jezebel. I'm not afraid of an Ahab. I'm not afraid of a demon. What I need to know is that God is with me. And if he is with me, who shall be against me? Body of Christ, this is our hour. This is our time. We shall see the glory revealed.